Greetings, comrades. In 2023, Russia does not have many friends left in the world. And even those countries whose populations generally have a positive attitude toward Russia are trying to remain officially neutral. Nevertheless, in the Western community there is a firm belief that Russia is now China's best friend. And China is Russia's best friend. Many are convinced that the good relations between Russia and China were always there. Come on, one was a communist state, the other is still a communist state, they share a huge border, they have never been at war with each other, surely they have always been the bestest of friends. Well, let's try to figure out what the history of the relationship between these two huge countries was and what the relationship between Russia and China is now, both at the level of states and at the level of ordinary people. Russian men and Chinese men are brothers forever. These are lines from the Soviet song Moscow Beijing, written in 1949 in honor of Mao Zedong's visit to the USSR. Both leaders loved the song. Stalin awarded the author of the music the Stalin Prize and Mao wanted to personally meet the author of the text. In the Aganyok magazine in 1950, the song was characterized as follows. In the harsh and laconic but sharp rises of the melody, in the measured, restrained rhythm of the song, one can hear the rapid and growing power, the courageous pathos of labor and struggle of free peoples. Yeah, a little too much pathos. After Khrushchev came to power, the reference to Stalin was removed from the song, and after the cooling of relations with China, the song was mostly forgotten. The expression Russian and Chinese are brothers forever began to be used ironically, because Russian and Chinese have been brothers forever for about as long as the song itself has lived, for 10 to 15 years max. What happened before and after that? The official relations between Russia and China turned 400 years old in 2018, an impressive amount of time indeed. Even more surprising is the fact that most of the current border between Russia and China, and the much larger old border that included both Mongolia and Central Asia, was formed not as a result of wars, but as a result of diplomatic agreements. It is quite rare in our world, especially on the Eurasian continent. Nevertheless, this relationship was never as fraternal and rosy as it is currently being portrayed. Back in the mid-17th century, a series of conflicts between Russia and Tsing Empire over the right to cultivate land suitable for agriculture in the Amur Basin took place, resulting in these lands being passed to China and Albazin, the first Russian settlement on the Amur, had to be abandoned for almost two centuries. There was the Kuljin crisis in 1871, when Russia supported the revolt of the Uyghurs and Dungans in China, and armed border conflicts between the USSR and China near Damansky Island in 1969. So the neighbors have never lived in perfect peace and harmony. But the scale of these conflicts is nothing compared to the wars waged at different times by Russia with most of the Europe and by China with Japan, the United States or Great Britain. Why? Well, it's simple. 400 or 500 years ago, neither China nor Russia were nation-states of the Western European type. The Russian Empire in Asia sought not to seize new lands for the settlement of its people or obtain new slaves, but to ensure stable economic ties with the Tsing Empire, as well as access to the sea. All this could be done without military clashes with another powerful empire. It was easier to seize the numerous lands of individual Siberian tribes and small nations and assimilate them. And China, in fact, did not even consider it essential to have strictly defined borders until the middle of the 19th century. Back then, China has regarded all the countries around it as dependent on itself as a more advanced civilization, and the doctrine of Sinocentrism has long prevailed in its foreign policy. China sought to build all its international relations vertically, the big brother-little brother relationship, no equality with anyone. China has always been confident that, even in the event of an armed invasion, it could always assimilate the enemy by moral and cultural superiority, not by armed force. And it certainly did not see the barbarians from the northwest as a worthy opponent. 
This Chinese picture of the world suffered a terrible collapse during the Opium Wars of the mid-19th century, when it turned out that not only the nation-states of Europe, but also self-isolated Japan were many times stronger than the God-chosen center of the world, whose army had forgotten how to fight during the last 200 years. Russia did not stand aside and snatched back a huge chunk of the Amur region. But in general, the countries managed to maintain some semblance of good relations. Russia did not try to turn the Chinese into virtual slavery and drug them with opium, did not destroy their cities and did not encroach on native Chinese lands. Although the Chinese with their very good long-term memories certainly have not yet forgotten the humiliating treaties of Aigon and Beijing. Funny, but both the heyday and the low point of this relationship between the two countries were under the same ruler, the great helmsman Mao. At first, young communist China was seen by the Soviet government as its main potential ally in a world divided by the Cold War. But the more the USSR helped its neighbors and the closer the countries came together, the more obvious the civilizational and ideological differences between the parties became. Mao saw the rebirth of Sinocentrism in the idea of communism, where the whole world would be united under the influence of one true ideology, and its center, of course, would be China. The USSR, on the other hand, pursued a course of relatively peaceful coexistence with the West and no longer craved a world revolution. After the deaths of Mao Zedong and Brezhnev, relations were normalized again, and the USSR and China never engaged in a major military conflict. But brotherly relations have not been restored to this day. However, if we forget about the grand slogans of Stalin's time, it becomes clear that Russian and Chinese have never been brothers. And the reason here is not even in the ever-present difference of ideologies and worldviews of the state, but in a more down-to-earth plane. The fact is that it's hard to find two more different nations on Earth than the Russians and the Chinese. Even now, in 2023, try to ask the most avid patriot of Russia, representatives of which nationality he considers closer to himself in spirit, the damned decaying Europeans or our main allies the Chinese? And the answer will be the same. Europeans are pretty much Russians, except they are brainwashed. A Russian and an American are united by a sacred belief in the absolute greatness and infallibility of their countries. A Russian and a Brazilian by a common concern about total corruption and bureaucracy in their countries. An average Russian and an average Indian by the idea that one must only endure a little bit more and after death he will be rewarded for it. Even in an African person, a Russian will find similar traits, a somewhat uncaring attitude toward everything around him and a love of freebies. And what do Russians and Chinese have in common? Well, except for the Amur River and 400 to 1009 kilometers of common border. A common communist past. To be honest, in Russia now it is fondly remembered only by the older generation over 60. And even they no longer remember the 1950s, the years of the closest friendship with China. Interest in each other's culture. Yeah, there have always been crowds of Chinese tourists in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but you can find such crowds in any European city. And China, for all its undoubtedly rich culture, remains something incomprehensible and distant for our people. For Russians, especially those 75% who live in the European part of the country, China is probably not even in the top 10 most popular tourist destinations. Even if we talk only about Asia, China is not the first choice for tourism. Vacation by the sea? Southeast Asia. Spiritual enlightenment? India or Nepal? Marveling at skyscrapers and technology, Japan or South Korea. Not to mention the fact that anime and K-pop in Russia are hundreds of times more popular than, say, Chinese movies. Hello, The cuisine? Absolutely not suitable for the Russian stomach. Nor are the mental values of the Chinese really relevant to a Russian person. Collectivism and industriousness, working flats out, the USSR of course tried to instill all these, but it is not exactly something that is typical for Russians. What we do have in common with the Chinese is our inherent division of everyone into us and them, and little love for learning foreign languages. 
As you can understand, although these are shared traits, they are not helpful for increasing mutual understanding between nations. Plus, the same Sinocentrism is very firmly planted in the mind of any Chinese. Most of them do not really care about the achievements of literature, culture, technology and science of foreign countries. Chinese tradition is still more important to them than anything else. Russians, on the other hand, have always been drawn to everything foreign and unfamiliar, even when the country was in a state of heart or cold war with half the world. In the end, if you look realistically, Russia and China are simply culturally incompatible. People just don't understand each other. Trade with each other. Sure, you don't need a deep understanding for that, you need money. Culturally assimilate and develop a kind of common traditionalist culture as opposed to western culture. That would be like trying to mix oil and water. Yes, if you believe recent polls, almost 80% of residents of China have a positive attitude toward Russia and say that their views on Russia have improved over the past three years. At the same time, 72.6% of Russians and 87% of Chinese respondents agree that the PRC and the Russian Federation should continue to strengthen comprehensive strategic cooperation. But this is their view of strategic development at the level of states, and at the domestic level, the Chinese still perceive Russia as a distant, northern and, most importantly, European country. The Russians are not ones of their own for them. The same thing works in the opposite direction. Russians in general know nearly nothing about Chinese culture or life. For Russians, China is some distant country with ghost skyscraper towns that gave them a Bieber sneakers in the 1990s, knickknacks from AliExpress in the 2010s, and the Genshin Impact game in the 2020s. For a Chinese person, Russia is a country of northern bears and insanely beautiful women. Yes, mutual interest has been growing lately, but not so fast. It's not enough for an eternal friendship or even for a lasting alliance. Nevertheless, of course, it cannot be denied that in today's conditions Russia and China have become closer politically. As you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But it is by no means love but rather a marriage of convenience, in which neither party is interested in a greater rapprochement than currently exists. China does not need to close off a friendship with Russia, Russia does not need too much of a dependence on China, but there has long been a view in the West that Russia has sold itself off to China. Has modern Russia really become a younger brother and vassal of China? Of course not. Not yet. We should start with the most widespread thesis about economic dependence, which turns out to be not so total. Even after record growth during the special military operation, China's share in Russia's trade has reached about 22%, which is undoubtedly a lot, but not unprecedented. China, for example, has the same share as South Korea's trade, and 26% in Australia's. Both countries are clearly not vassals or even allies of China. Taiwan's share is 40%, by the way. China is the largest trading partner for about 120 states, and many of them are more economically dependent on it than Russia. Yes, in terms of gas exports, China is now virtually the only destination. But in terms of oil exports, China is roughly on par with India and the rest of the smaller developing countries. Has Russia joined Xi Jinping's flagship Belt and Road project? Recognized China's claims to the South China Sea? Has it entered into any new concession agreements with it? Agreed to host harmful Chinese production facilities in the Far East? Maybe at least stopped deliberately and publicly initiating criminal cases of espionage in favor of China among Russian scientists? No. Vessels do not behave this way. Another question, uh, why would China seek vessel status for Russia? Even without any pressure, it is hard to find areas where Russia would refuse to cooperate with China on normal terms. The Russian market is open to Chinese goods, Russia is quite willing to supply China with resources, and now it is buying critical equipment almost exclusively from China. Even the great and terrible Moskvich has now become a purebred Chinese. Everybody is generally happy with this, so it makes no sense for China to pressure Russia in order to show its superiority in everything, especially since Russia has recently proven its unpredictability under pressure. Who knows how the Russian leadership will react to China's sudden demands that infringe on Russian interests? 
In addition, China has long been intentionally preparing for a long confrontation with the West, and it is officially regarded as a strategic adversary both in the United States and the European Union. This means that it is only a matter of time before Russian-style sanctions are imposed against it. China is closely watching Russia and studying how and with what damage to the country's life these very sanctions can be circumvented. Of course, the economies of China and Russia are very different, but some points can be studied and adopted. It is the same with the military component. Most Russian and Chinese weapons are either copies or evolutions of Soviet designs and models. Right now, as cynical as it may sound, they are undergoing a real test in a clash with Western equipment. Relations between Russia and China are by no means unclouded, but the common interests of the leaders of the two countries and their common enemy create a sufficiently solid basis for relatively equal cooperation. China definitely has a certain opportunity to turn Russia into its vessel, but there is not much reason to do so. At the same time, the ideas of Sinocentrism most likely have not gone anywhere. China still considers itself the big brother to all its neighbors. Just as Russia, at least its rulers, considers itself heir of the USSR and therefore responsible for all its neighbors, including China. As a result, China looks at Russia as a huge stockpile of resources and nuclear weapons, which is always close at hand. Russia looks at China as a huge stockpile of cheap labor and goods, which is also always close at hand. At the same time, China's revanchism still smolders. Many consider Russia, though not the most prominent, but still a part of the colonial system that dealt China a crushing blow in the mid-19th century. And Russia is still wary of the one and a half billion neighbors who, in theory, could happily populate the vast expanse of its Far East. And deep down, each side firmly believes that at the moment this cooperation is more profitable for them than for their partner. And if something might change, then only for the worse. There may be no love in this relationship, but there is absolutely no reason for it to deteriorate or change in the near future either. Thanks for watching. What do you think about this unusual friendship? And as always, a huge shout out to Stick to One, Steven, Yelisaveta Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berze, Jordan Lamotte, Jimmy Albin, Ellie, and Peter Illich. See you guys in two weeks.